Turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 2, Psalm number 2, and let me uh, open this time in prayer. Father, I thank you for giving us your word and for the riches that it contains. And I thank you for the privilege of worshiping you and the blessing of, of your favor. Uh, the blessing that we have to be able to find refuge in you and to know your truth. I pray that you would help us to uh, be like the... Uh, the man in, in Psalm 1 who delights in your law rather than like the kings in Psalm 2 who uh, rebel against your authority. I uh, pray that you would help me as I preach. Uh, please guide my thoughts and my words. Uh, I pray that you would uh, help everyone as, as we listen to your word and think about your word. Please guide our thoughts. And give us the grace to do what your word tells us to do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we, uh, as we get to Psalm chapter 2, uh, I want to, to relate it to our experience here in the United States in the 21st century, uh, because this was, psalm was written a long time ago, uh, a very different culture from ours. Uh, but uh, there's, uh, you know, do you, can, you, can you identify with a, uh, a political climate in which there are powerful political leaders who, who kind of seem to be doing what they please? <laughs> Uh, and don't seem to be experiencing uh, God's judgment for it, uh, but who are, are acting in, in direct rebellion against God. I was just reading uh, yesterday, uh, was it yesterday, maybe two days ago, uh, about a cadet at the Air Force Academy that had, that had written a Bible verse on his uh, whiteboard on, on his dorm room door. And uh, the... Uh, an atheist group uh, saw it and and got the uh, the authorities of the school to remove his whiteboard altogether so that he could not display Bible verses on his door his dorm room door anymore. Uh, you know, I don't I don't know the full story behind that, but that sounds unjust to me. It sounds uh, like there are some uh, some political people that that hated God that that uh, that seemed to win the day for now on that one. Uh, there's, uh, yeah, there's a, other, uh, a, a person that I've, I have, uh, well, the, the baker in uh, Denver, Christian man, family-run bakery, uh, refused to bake a wedding cake for a homosexual wedding. Uh, he, he, he didn't mind making cakes for these for these people to eat uh, the problem was he didn't want to make a wedding cake that would that would affirm what they were doing because he believed what they were doing was against God's law and uh, so they, they that the uh, a lawsuit has been brought against him even the Attorney General uh, of Colorado ruled if I, if I remember correctly it was him who, who ruled that uh, that this man had to bake a wedding cake for this this uh, unbiblical wedding, uh, and he's still refusing to do it, and is facing fines and and uh, pickets at his business, and it's you know it's 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 crazy. It seems like those who are in rebellion against God's law are winning the day, uh, and there are many you know many other things that we see you know the. Uh, recent legalization of, of, of uh, pot in, in uh, Colorado. Um, there's a, there is a, a uh, you know, in the, in the libertarian stream, there is this philosophy that we should be able to do whatever we want. Uh, there should not be laws to restrain us. 
uh, we should be able to do whatever, as long as we're not hurting anybody else, is, is the libertarian philosophy. Uh, and, 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 part, and parcel of that libertarian philosophy is the belief that we can decide for ourselves what is right and wrong, and there is no outside God imposing on us the standards of what is right and wrong. And so uh, and libertarians as well as liberals, which may be in very different political camps currently in our country, both stand in rebellion against God's law. And so it's, you know, it's been the liberals on the other side that have, uh, you know, that forced the removal of the Ten Commandments from the uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, building uh, in Alabama, uh, when, as my understanding is, the, the Judge Roy Moore paid for the monument himself. It wasn't done at taxpayer expense. Uh, and he was seeking to, to uh, he put that monument there. And well, we had the same situation in our own town uh, not too long ago as well. Someone paid to put the Ten Commandments in a, in a very visible place that uh, sought to indicate that God's law should govern our society, that the, that the, the basic principles of God's law uh, are the basic principles upon which a, a good society can thrive. Uh, you know, we don't want to steal. We don't want to commit murder. These are, you know, commit adultery, uh, lie, honor parents. You know, these are, these are basic foundations of, of society. You get rid of any of them, and you're not going to have a happy, uh, happy uh, community. Uh, but, but people, in the, you know, those who are standing opposed to God don't want this reminder that the Ten Commandments has anything to do with them or anything to do with how our community should operate. Uh, now, I don't expect that you all are in that camp. I don't expect you're in that libertarian, I hate authority camp. Uh, it's a very dangerous one uh, to be in. Uh, it's very, it's very uh, appealing to want to do whatever you want to do, isn't it? Uh, parents, we uh, see this in our children. <laughs> they want to do what they want to do. I, I'm constantly dealing with that with, that, with uh, my little uh, three-year-old. <laughs> but I don't want to, he says. <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> it's not about what you want to do. It's about what must be done. Uh, when we look in, in the, at the news, it can be, it can be scary, frightening, uh, depressing, that it looks like the bad guys are winning the day. Those in, those in a rebellion to God are winning the day. It looks like that and if we look at the news. And we long for God to bring justice. We, we long for righteousness to, uh, to be renewed uh, in, our, in our society. Uh, and, and we may fear that you know, as, as evil grows in our society... Are we safe? You know, what, uh, how can we find the security we need? I think all of these themes are, are very, very much embedded in Psalm 2. And uh, I want to, want to deal with these as we get into it. I'm not sure how far into the psalm I'll get this morning, um, but I'm just going to see what we can do here. Uh, It's the second psalm. Acts 13 uh, has, says so explicitly. Uh, and it seems it, it is this, uh, as, the, as the, the first two psalms in the Psalter seem to have an uh, or, or introductory of the entire Psalter. Neither of them have a superscription. They don't say from David or according to the whatever tune. Uh, they just don't dive right in, and uh, but it, but Acts two does tell us that it was written by David, and uh, it's been estimated. You know, this is around 1047 B.C. I I didn't double check uh, Plummer's uh, guess, but it seems reasonable to me. Uh, 
as we look at Psalm 2, we're going to see words and phrases that are, that are in common between Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Uh, we're going to see that there's two ways both of these psalms talk about the two ways, one of rebellion against God, one of submission to his law word. Uh, we're going to see the, uh, you know, the, the Lord is, a, is, a key, is, is the governing character who, who makes sense out of the disorder in this world in both psalms. Uh, his law, his word, his decree is, is the way that he has communicated His order in this world. And we see that in both Psalms. And the one who delights in the law is the one who's blessed. Uh, The one who rebels against the Son is cursed, perishes. Then both Psalms uh, speak of a coming judgment. So there's there's a lot in common between these two Psalms. Uh, But... Uh, as Matthew Henry wrote, uh, as it's necessary to our acceptance with God that we should be subject to the precepts of his law, uh, especially, you know, uh, which is Psalm 1, so it is likewise that we should be subject to the grace of his gospel and come to him in the name of a mediator. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him, Psalm 2. Uh, let's see, was there anything else? Oh, yeah, this is one of the royal psalms. Uh, there's... Uh, what, about 10 of them, uh, 10, 11, 12, of, uh, uh, psalms that's, that are directed especially to kings and deal especially with the, the matters of law and order uh, or of, of royalty. And, and, and all these royal psalms touch on this, the covenant God made with David uh, that that. Your descendants will always rule as, as kings. Uh, there will never lack to be a descendant on, the, on your throne. And, and the, mess, the fulfillment of the Messiah on that is, uh, so in, in all of these royal psalms, there's you know, one about a, a wedding of the, of the, the prince and, and the, the, uh, the, the daughter of princes who's, who's uh, and it goes through the whole wedding ceremony. There's... Uh, Psalms about law, and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember others. The, uh, the uh, oh yeah, right. The uh, destroying of the enemies. The Lord said to my Lord, "Sit at my feet until I make all the enemy your enemies your footstool." Uh, the, these are these are things that kings do, and these psalms relate directly to that and are fulfilled in what Jesus does as the Messiah. Uh, if we look at this, at, at Psalm 2, kind of the, uh, at a broad scope, uh, we see a chiasm again, like I, I mentioned Psalm 1 has. And I, I don't know how, how long I'm going to go with, with this chiasm thing, but I'm still going hog wild with it right now. Uh, but you can see that the, the arrangement of the words in each verse uh, of Psalm 2 uh, are such in Hebrew may not show up as, mu- as much in English, but in Hebrew you have a phrase and then you have a key word and then you have a synonym for that key word and then another phrase. I'm looking at it backwards, but I'm teaching you Hebrew by <laughs> going left to right. Uh, uh, so in verse 1 we have nations and peoples. Verse 2 we have kings and rulers. Verse 5, anger, wrath are the two words that are next to each other in the middle of the verse. And then verse 7 is, is totally different from all the other verses. The word I is at the beginning of the verse, and the word you is at the end of the verse. And there's not two synonyms in, in the middle of it like, like the other verses. Then, then we get three more verses at, towards the end. Inheritance, possession, break, shatter, be wise, take warning. Uh, so there's a... Even, even by the way that the words are laid out in the Hebrew sentences here, there is a focus on what the subject is. You know, we can see this is about uh, kings needing to uh, govern people and that there is a judgment coming. You know, anger, wrath of God, he's going to break, shatter the nations. And... Uh, 
So the bottom line is uh, be wise and take warning. And what is, the, what is it that they need to be wise about and take warning about? Well, that's in the center of the chiasm. Uh, I have de- declared the decree of the Lord. You are my son. This day I've forgotten you. We need, the kings need to get that right. What does that mean? And how does that apply to their lives? Who is this, this son of God who is the king of kings that they need to be in a right relationship with? Uh, let me just read through the psalm here. Uh, I apologize for the small text there that I had to do to get it all in here. What have, the, what have the nations clamored for and the peoples vainly meditate for? Kings of the earth set themselves up and distinguished men establish unity against Jehovah and against his anointed one. Let us burst their chains and let us throw their bindings from us. The one sitting in the heavens laughs. The master mocks at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger, and in his rage he will make them nervous. But as for me, I appointed my king over Zion, the hill of my holiness. I will record the decree of of Yahweh or Jehovah, the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. It was I who gave birth to you today. Ask of me, and I will give nations of your inheritance and your possession the ends of the earth. You will break them with a rod of iron like a potter's vessel. You will shatter them. So now, O kings, consider wisely. Be disciplined, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage without hindrance or pay homage to the sun. Otherwise, he will become angry, and y'all will perish in the way, for his anger rages like a short fuse. Uh, Oh, the blessings of all who take refuge in him. Uh, As I, the the little diagrams here note the the chiastic structure again. And the outer uh, uh, outer two, uh, uh, three sets, sorry, there's one. The outer three sets, we have opposites. We have these, these uh, vain, clamoring nations versus the blessed person who is experiencing refuge. We have the kings of the earth that are in rebellion versus the ideal of serving the Lord and, and, uh, pay, and paying homage to him. We have uh, the one sitting in heaven, the, the master, the king of kings, and then we have the kings on earth being told, okay, this, the, the, these opposites. And then we have, we have uh, similars in the, in the inner core of the psalm. Uh, we have God's judgment, uh, speaking in terms of, of his, his word, uh, which is paralleled in the judgment of the sun, uh, breaking them with a rod of iron. And we have the, uh, the God speaking of, of anointing his king, and we have the king receiving the possession of, of his inheritance. And then the center, the, the main point, again, why I talked about uh, the, the verse 7 being the center of the chiasm, this is the thing that needs to be gotten right by these kings, is you're my son, and it was I who gave you birth today. I'm, I want to, to uh, step into that and, and explain some of the uh, concepts uh, as we go just verse by verse through here. The nations are introduced in this psalm. Uh, this is an important concept. What, what, what do we do with everybody outside the Jewish nation? Uh, what is their role in redemptive history? Uh, what does the Bible say about everybody else but the Jews? People like us who aren't Jews. What does the Bible have to say to us? Uh, is there a message for us or is the Bible just to Jews? Well, this tells us that there is a message for us, not just to Jews, that we can have a relationship with the Son of God and be made right with God, too. Uh, the nations are, are raging, uh, roaring, cons- uh, and the, the idea is there's, there's this you know, courtroom 
and God is the judge. And there's this group of people in the back that are murmuring and, and uh, causing disruption. And he's going he's gonna to deal with them. Uh, you know, they, they're putting their heads together to try to, to circumvent his justice. They're trying to, to uh, do what is wrong and uh, imagining or plotting or devising. It's the same word, meditate, that we find in uh, Psalm 1. In his law, he meditates day and night. Uh, they're, you know, murmuring. But what they're murmuring is not God's law. They're, they don't have God's word in them. And they're, they're not thinking about God's word and allowing their minds to be molded by God's word. Instead, their minds are molded by rebellion against God. And that's all they can think of. That's all they're muttering about. Uh, and we, the, the verse, this, uh, the whole psalm starts with a question. What or why? <coughs> uh, this can be taken in two ways. Uh, what, one would be, you know, uh, I'm confused. Here I am, I'm looking at the news reports, I've, I, or here I am, I've experienced some injustice. Why? Are bad things happening? Why is justice not happening? If there's a God up there, why is it happening? Why, you know, why, why am I not seeing justice being done right now? Uh, this is a, a, it's a legitimate prayer if we come to God in faith <laughs> seeking for the answer to that, uh, believing that he really is there and that he, that, that, that he really does have an answer for us. Uh, there's also uh, the the uh, it's the the sense this can also be taken in the sense of of, of kind of a, a rebuke to uh, a rebellious person. You know, you've ever heard your mom say, "Why did you do that?" <laughs> uh, it's it's it, it raises it kind of it's uh, it can be used to to raise the uh, raise the question of Do you realize how stupid? <laughs> What you're doing is to rebel against God uh, because it's vain. Uh, Habakkuk talks about the, the, the vanity of, of apartness from God. Is it not indeed apart from the Lord of hosts that peoples toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? Uh, this is the same word, vanity, vanity. Uh, or vainly, or I don't remember what all the other translations were for that word, but Habakkuk, too, uses that same word. It is, apart from God, our thoughts, our, our uh, rebellion is vain. Uh, the way we spend our time when we are apart from God is vain. It's not going to do us or anybody else any good. Uh, in relationship with God... When our, when our thoughts are molded by the Word of God, then they become meaningful. Then we find uh, it's not vain. Our work will not be in vain. Uh, so this is uh, yeah, the contrast with what's going on in Psalm 1, which focuses on the blessed man. Here we start with a focus on the, the cursed man. Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves up, or they take their stand. It's a, it's a reflexive uh, hit payel, yit yatsbu. Uh, they're, they are establishing themselves uh, not uh, estab- you know, with respect to themselves rather than establishing themselves with respect to God. Or the, you know, the, the man who stands on the rock that gives him a foundation to stand on these people are setting themselves up, building their own foundation of their own, building their own sense of truth and right and wrong and, and purpose in life. Uh, is there anything? They, they are unified. And, and uh, don't we hear much about community and uh, unity and peace in our culture today? Uh, there is a, a peace and a unity which can be had in Christ but the peace and the unity that is had apart from God uh, 
and human ideas and that human rebellion against God is is evil. They are taking, uh, they're antagonizing here uh, not only the Jehovah, the Lord, and the Hebrew here uses the personal name for the one true God. It's just the Old Testament personal name. And Jews uh, and Christians uh, throughout history have often uh, shied away from using the personal name Yahweh or Jehovah uh, so as not to take the name of the Lord in vain by accident. Uh, and that, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other on that. The apostles themselves use the word Lord in, in the New Testament instead of uh, a proper name in there. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a perfectly Christian thing to do to say Lord. Uh, I'm just translating the Hebrew here. <laughs> uh, but notice that there are two people. The Lord and His Anointed One. Uh, so there's there is a, there is a relationship that God has with another person, which all these kings are in united opposition against. Now I want to look at who that other person is as as we go on and develop this idea. Who is the other person besides Jehovah God? Uh, it's here. It's the anointed one. The the Hebrew word literally has to do with pouring oil on someone's head, which is what was done with pre, uh, kings and with priests. Uh, and this is the and the word Messiah is the is the is the same root as the as the Hebrew word here, anointed one. And the Greek word is uh, Christ. So you hear that christening. If you've heard of a, a christening where uh, I guess in that case, water is poured over the head of a, of a, of a baby. That's the same root word. Uh, it's Greek is Christ, Hebrew is Messiah. English, anointed. Uh, the kings, though, in opposition to the Lord and his special uh, person here, his anointed one, the kings are saying, let's burst their chains. So there refers to the Lord and his anointed one. They have some kind of chains or fetters, which uh, ropes, cords, binders, which they are se- the the Lord and His anointed one are seeking to impose upon the nations, and the nations are saying, "We want none of your rules. We don't want to be controlled by you, God." And they want to throw off their authority. Uh, Jeremiah also talks about these same bonds and, uh, and specifically links them to the way of the Lord and the ordinances of God. You see this here in the, the parallelism of Jeremiah 5.5. 5. I'll go to the great ones uh, and I'll speak to them for they know the way of the Lord and the ordinance of their God. But they too with one accord have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Uh, of course in Jeremiah's day, there was this same rebellion against God going on in Jerusalem. And uh, people were worshiping idols and uh, forgetting God's law, neglecting the worship of the, in the temple. And so God brought uh, I, Jeremiah to warn them that what they were doing was wrong. He brought the Chaldeans in to destroy Jerusalem uh, as, because they did not listen to Jeremiah's message as well as the messages of the other prophets. So here's the, here's the perfect contrast to the Psalm 1, blessed man who delights in God's law. These people want God's law thrown off of them. They don't want to be controlled by God's uh, rules. But God's rules, God's law, His covenantal structure actually brings blessing. In Hosea 11, it speaks with, about the same bonds, calling them bonds of love. Uh, and, of course, in, in Hosea, the picture is, is of marriage. God marrying his people, bringing a, a bond uh, that, that 
yes, it brings rules and regulations and, and structure to life, uh, boundaries, things you do and don't do in a marriage. Uh, and, that, and it brings order. It brings blessing. It brings good. It brings new life. Uh, the, the, uh, the law of God, the covenantal uh, enclosure of God and his rulership and leadership are not a problem. They're what they are the solution. If you if we reject his bonds of of love and law and order and and uh, submission to his leadership, uh, then we end up with just as much bondage as 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 we as as the wicked fear will happen under God, uh, and Isaiah talked about that, referring back to the same kind of days in which Jeremiah lived, uh, where there's they had rebelled against God, and so there was uh, bonds of wickedness, uh, bands of yokes, oppression going on in their day, and the only way to to be freed from that bondage and oppression of human oppression is to return to the law of God and submit to God and find in him the freedom within the confines of his covenantal structure. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see the perspective here, though. The psalm writer is seeing the nations raging, seeing the united opposition against God, and instead of despairing, what can we do? Uh, what's the point of serving God? It's not going to do me any good. Uh, <clears throat> he instead gets the big picture. He, he says, no, there's a, there's a God up in heaven who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is actually laughing at all of this. And the, the, the Hebrew word yashchak has to do with playing a game, uh, having fun. Uh, the Lord laughs at him, and, and you can see this isn't the only place in the Bible where laughing uh, kind of scoffing at wickedness, which is kind of the opposite of what the wicked do. They scoff at God and righteousness. Uh, there is a place for scoffing at wickedness. Uh, <clears throat> when the when the uh, prophet Elijah upon upon the mountain uh, made fun of the of the Baal, the priests of Baal, you know, maybe your God's taking a nap. Yell louder. We, it's, uh, there is a place. I'm not saying you should always do it at a, on every occasion, but there is a place for pointing out the ridiculousness of rebellion against God. Uh, the Lord laughs. And we see the uh, the the in Psalm one we have we had a seat right the seat of the scoffers, uh, and and I noted that that the implication of the Hebrew word seat was that this is someone in leadership, a judge or a king, uh, but here we have a seat in, in Psalm two four that is it's not on a level with the scoffers it's up in heaven. Uh, is far exalted, and then the the word Adonai is the word in verse four in the second half of verse four. The master, the Lord, mocks at them again. This time, it's not the proper name for God; it is it is the title of the of the king or the master. Uh, it's a different Hebrew word. Uh, it's the word for master or lord. Uh, the, the nations, these kings, appear to be very powerful, but the Lord, the Master, is Lord of them all, and He is really the one in control. And His, His, His slowness 
to immediately destroy the wicked is not because he can't overcome the evil. It's because he's laughing about it right now. And I'm not sure exactly. uh, That's hard for me to understand. Uh, And and his laughing is not the only thing he's doing. It's not, you know, he, he is even in, if we look at the whole context of Scripture, uh, we see that he's also bringing good out of the evil. He is instructing us. He is, cha- he is developing our faith. There's, there's many things that he's doing, uh, and he's doing it all at once because as the, as the, as the unchangeable God, he, he's, not, uh, he's not like us that can only do one or two things at a time. Uh, he's always mocked at evil. It's always been ridiculous to him to, to, uh, to spit in his face. I think that, uh, I th- well, yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll end here with verse 5 and then we'll plan to pick up next week with the rest. Uh, but we have... God's does bring God's response does come. Not only is it is it laughter, mockery, a realization of the ridiculousness of rebellion against Him, uh, but there's also a judgment that will come against the wicked, and uh, it's uh, this judgment is is uh, the word speak is is used here in verse five to and and fury. Uh, burning, uh, haron is the is the word for that I translated fury. Um, anger, the Hebrew word for anger, af, has to do with your nose. Uh, the uh, when you get angry, sometimes your nose flares or gets red. Uh, it's and and God does get angry. Uh, the in in. Uh, you know, modern evangelicalism, it's, it's easy to forget, or maybe, maybe uh, in, in liberalism more is, is where it's happened, is they have forgotten that God gets angry. They focus on his love, and his love is a true thing, and it is great, but uh, the, the liberal, uh, whatever, the liberal streams have forgotten the anger of God, the justice of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. And these two things are held in tension. He, 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 he has them together in one personality. Uh, God gets angry when people rebel against him. He hates it, and he will judge it. Uh, the word that... that I, I translated make them nervous. I, I feel like I, I stepped a little out to the edge to, to make that translation. But the, the, the root meaning of it is that they hurry up. Uh, and, and, and I just, the, the picture of, you know, you see somebody who the, uh, the, the you know, the authority is, is approaching and they, and, and they start hurrying <laughs> because they know they're in trouble. And, uh, uh, that's the picture that comes to my mind. Uh, if he, he's going to, he's, his approach is going to frighten them, make them nervous, uh, make them start hurrying and, and doing more stupid things, uh, lose control. Uh, and this God has done this throughout history. Uh, it's, it's, we need to, to remind ourselves and, and, and encourage our faith with this that uh, even though it looks like whatever it is that's in front of you right now is, is, uh, is not going to work. Uh, you know, whether, whether you're worried about the current political system right now or whether you're, you know, you're looking at the, the system of another country or uh, the, you know, as, as the porters go to China, you're going you're gonna to bonk your heads against frustrating Things and just the evilness and corruption of of people in another country, uh, and and or or whether it's you know we're bumping up against the the sin nature of a child, parents that it just doesn't look like we're, God's ever going to get through to them. 
or you know husband or or whoever whoever it is that just it just seems like that there's no point their rebellion is too hard uh, God has brought to judgment and God uh, many throughout history uh, you know he took the the uh, chariots of Pharaoh and the the invincible army of the greatest nation in the world drowned them in the sea and and brought this this insignificant country of slaves into freedom and established them with with his law. Uh, He has done amazing changes throughout the past. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel, which which reigned for a long time and and were terribly wicked and and persecuted, killed the prophets and persecuted believers and, and, you know, brought idols right into the temple for people to worship idols instead of God. Uh, both of them came to terrible, degrading ends. God's justice was served on them eventually. Uh, there's, and there's others who, who seemed like the impossible cases that God just he changed their hearts, like the Apostle Paul, who spent his life killing and imprisoning Christians. And then suddenly God just changed what seemed like an impossible man and turned him into one of the greatest preachers ever. Uh, God can do anything. He can change. And his, he's going to break through at some point, uh, whether it is in the judgment of, of, of hell or whether it is in the transformation of this person. Uh, we always hope we should always hope that it will be their, their, their salvation and transformation to, to bow their knee before him before they have to in the judgment. But I want to encourage you with, with that truth that God is uh, sovereignly in control. He is, uh, and, and we can trust what he's doing. He will bring justice and we need only wait Wait upon the Lord, and we will and, t- and ourselves continue to trust that He will indeed keep us safe. He will indeed save us. He is indeed the only place where we can find our security and refuge.